again, it's really finding where that audience is and then providing value. And value, like I say, can come in a lot of different forms. I love personally giving away insight. Hey, Millionaire University, you are invited to the main event. What event am I talking about? Well, you're going to have to listen to today's episode to understand how you can utilize the power of experiential marketing to leverage growth of your business. Today, we brought on Ray Sheehan, who is an expert of this. He has a marketing agency that specializes in experiential marketing, and he's going to share with us what he has done to incorporate more of the personal touch when it comes to marketing and getting in front of your ideal customer and being in the places where they're already hanging out and how you can leverage that into your business and even the scalability of it. So get ready to take some notes because today is going to be an event of epic proportions. Class is in session. All right. Welcome to the show, Ray. So great to have you. We're going to have a phenomenal conversation. I can already tell about what you do and how we can help a lot of these business owners who are listening to have some enhanced marketing strategies under their belt. So thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me on the pod. Super excited about today's conversation. So yeah, anytime I can talk about marketing, experiential marketing, you have my attention. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This is going to be great. So before we get into that, you obviously are a business owner yourself. You have a marketing agency. Can you give us a little background into where that came about? Have you always had a passion for marketing, experiential marketing? Where did that come into the picture? Just give us a little snapshot of how we got to where we are. Yeah, it's a great question. It's it's interesting, kind of like how we landed the plane. I actually came from the special event space. So at a very young age, for whatever reason, I always had a knack for engaging and interacting with people. And I love bringing people together. It was just something I had a real passion for as a promoter, as a DJ, as a concert promoter, just love bringing people together. So my story started really producing events. And those events really turned into much larger, large scale festivals, really, where we would take over major league ballparks and produce craft beer festivals and taco festivals and pizza festivals. Very lifestyle driven events is really where I started. So when we would host these events, we had a lot of brands come out to our events. And really, the brands were there to shake hands, kiss babies, interact with our attendees, and they were there to really sell products and services telecom, insurance, home improvement, banking, you name it. So that was my first kind of introduction into working with the brands by way of my events. And then once COVID landed on my lap and we could no longer produce events, I quickly had to pivot and figure out a way, okay, how can I still run a business? And that's where the experiential agency really started four years ago. Yeah, I think we all can agree that there were some major curveballs thrown when COVID hit and we had to make some huge adaptations to the way that we run business. And some people, it was like a huge advantage. And for the rest of us, well, for a lot of people, it was major questions I didn't have to ask myself about how I'm going to function in business now. And in the event space in particular, yeah, that would be a huge transition that you're going to have to make. So what are some of the principles? Let's just break this down because I know that we can't create massive scale events all the time anyway. You might have budget restrictions, you might be starting out in a business, but I know that there's probably some elements to this that can apply no matter the size of your business. So let's, can we talk about how you started to bridge that gap of seeing, hey, we can still create experiences in our marketing without it being live and in person? Yeah. So there's a lot of your listeners or your audience probably have a business or they're thinking about starting their business. And there's a lot of different ways to market your business. The one area where we focus the most time and energy, and it really, again, it comes back to my background of actually doing events. So for us, our strategy was how can we take your brand and really integrate your brand or company into the fabric of the community? And to me, it's just another piece of your marketing strategy, whether you're doing pay-per-click or SEO or email marketing. To me, experiential marketing is just another vertical to go out and to really engage the community. And I love billboards. I love radio, love print. I think it all works, right? Advertising really works in frequency. So I'm not one of those guys that say that doesn't work or this does work. The one thing that I love about experiential marketing is it really gives you an opportunity to start to have a conversation with your target customer. And once you start having a conversation with your target customer, you start to really understand your customer so much better. 
And then more importantly, you start to really understand the company, your company. Maybe there are certain things that you should be doing differently. Maybe your customer service is failing, or maybe your audience or your customer is looking for a certain product extension. Clearly, when you're out there marketing, you're doing experiential marketing, you're marketing your brand. So ultimately, the brands that we work with, our report card is sales, right? They're out there for lead generation. They're out there to close business. So that's really the one that people probably focus on the, on the most. But there's clearly a much softer side of taking your brand. And this could be small, medium, or large. There might be someone listening right now who has a very small business or a medium-sized business or a large fortune 500 company really doesn't matter all this is really applicable to any brand or company out there and there's events come in a lot of different shapes and sizes to take your brand and get your brand out into the community yeah well i mean that's good to hear because i know like i said we're all coming in at different points in our businesses and looking for ways to create more of that connection so talk to me a little bit about that on what this looks like on a maybe granular level of creating more of that experience within our marketing efforts yeah. So the first thing you really want to decide, who is your audience? Like you really, and it's probably like a, a dub, but it, it's really important. Like you have to think about, okay, my target customer, where is my target customer when they're not interacting with my brand? Am I interested in a young active audience? Am I interested in a millennial? Am I interested in Gen Z? Am I interested in engaging our parents? Am I interested in really doesn't, you know, to me, it's really understanding who your target audience is. And then when your target audience, again, is not interacting with your brand, where is he or she? Where can I find that target audience? So now it's like, okay, there's probably different retail partners. Maybe they're grocery partners. Maybe there's events. Maybe there's a, the local parade on Main Street. Maybe there's a festival. Maybe they're really into music. Maybe they're really into home improvement, whatever the case may be. So now it's like, okay, I know my audience. I know where my audience is when they're not engaging with me. Now I want to go to that area, to that space when my target customer has their barrier down, so to speak. And this is when I can go out and have that interaction and have a very organic conversation with my target audience. And again, this could be something that's very large scale. I mean, there's a lot of events and festivals out there, or this could be something that's very simplistic where I'm going to my local Ace Hardware store in my local community on Main Street because my target audience is a homeowner. Great, six foot table, table skirt, the marketing materials. And I'm there now to have a really engaging conversation with that consumer as he or she is getting out of their vehicle to walk into the local Ace Hardware store to buy a gallon of paint and build that consumer confidence with that consumer. Or it could be something much larger where I'm at a 200, 100,000 person music festival engaging all these young, active adults to tell them why my product is amazing. So it really starts with understanding your audience and then figuring out, okay, when can and where can I find my target audience when they're not engaging with my brand? Mm -hmm. So with that being said, when you put yourself into these situations, you know, obviously people, we go to events, maybe we don't necessarily expect to see a vendor outside of Ace Hardware necessarily or to engage in that way. And you mentioned letting, having your customers with their guard down. How do we now bridge that gap to having a conversation where this isn't even on their mind right now? Maybe you're buying a gallon of paint, you're, you're a homeowner but you're at a music festival, maybe your product is relevant because those are where your people are. But what do you recommend even with your clients on how do we start the conversation to where it's not just this out of the blue, you didn't come here for this, but here it is. <laughs> yeah. So for me, it's all about providing value and value comes in a lot of different currencies. It could be something that's like, Hey, we're giving away a free ACE gift card today. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. I'm at ACE. I'm not going to Ace Hardware because I'm going to the mall and just window shopping. I'm probably going to that hardware store because I actually need something. I'm going there because I have a problem. I need to fix something or I need, I'm doing something in my lawn. So there's someone outside of Ace Hardware actually giving away an Ace gift card. Well, that's interesting because I'm here to buy something. So you're giving away an Ace gift card. Well, how do I win that Ace gift card? And maybe it's something as simple as like, oh, we're doing a little fun game. We're playing spin the wheel, spin the wheel. Maybe you get a branded t-shirt or a hat or a pen or an Ace gift card. So now you at least have the consumer over there where you can at least start having a conversation. 
hey, are you in the market for this? Hey, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever considered these sort of things that your products or services might be? Again, you need to make sure it kind of aligns with that retail part. Maybe it's not Ace Hardware. Maybe it's a retail store that sells certain clothing, or maybe it's a garden center, and you're trying to get in touch with the real decision maker in my household, which is my wife, right? So again, it's really finding where that audience is and then providing value. And value, like I say, can come in a lot of different forms. I love personally giving away insight. Think about this podcast right now. People are listening to this podcast. Hopefully they're getting some insight out of this, but I'm sure all the pods that you do, there's a little nugget of information there that you're providing to your audience. And I look at the experiential marketing as the same way. We're here to solve products or services. We're here to solve a solution, but how can I help the consumer? How can I lead the consumer down a path? Maybe it's a do it yourself project. Maybe it's how to create a more energy efficient, whatever. Maybe it's how you're going to save the planet. Maybe it's our corporate social responsibility, whatever the case may be, you're there. So when that consumer walks away, they're just a little smarter before they got there. That's value. So it could be something as simple as that that gift card I mentioned, or it could be you're giving them some information that they didn't know. And to me, that's worth something. And now you've kind of broken down the barrier. You've had that conversation. So now the next time that consumer is in the market to buy whatever that product or service is, they're going to think about your brand more differently because you were there to have that conversation. You broke down the barrier. You provided that valuable insight or education. There's a much higher probability now when they do need something, they're probably going to call you. Yeah. Well, and on that note, would you say that this approach is more of a long game strategy? Because even in the beginning, you're like, it really doesn't matter. We can billboards, all of the things, they work essentially in the same way. And when you're getting into this more experiential face-to-face environment, are we going out there with the anticipation we're going to see immediate sales? Like are the clients that you're working with setting up booths and they're actually hoping to sell product or services same day? Or is this more of a, just starting to really integrate into the community and building that name and that exposure? It's all of the above. If you really think about it, like Coca-Cola didn't put up one ad and say, Hey, our job here is done, right? Like they're constantly out. It's all about frequency. So it's the same thing as like whether you're listening to a spot on the radio or TV or a billboard, you constantly are being reminded about T-Mobile. And then ultimately when you're not happy with their service, I mean, you're thinking maybe, okay, now they're going to think more favorably about T-Mobile. Experiential marketing is the same thing. You're constantly out. The different thing about experiential marketing, not the different, but you're now at their play space. So if I'm a consumer, it's like, wow, T-Mobile really understands me. Like they know I'm here and the fact that they're here, there's alignment there. There's some brand affinity there because they've gone out of their way to come to where I'm at. So they're showing an interest in me. So for me, it's like if when you're doing the experiential marketing and you're there and you're engaging with that consumer, yes, you want to build that kind of that frequency and constantly being there. But it's also showing the consumer, hey, we're similar. We have the same sort of likes and interests. We share the same sort of culture or beliefs or what have you. And to me, these are all little things that help from a consumer confidence standpoint. So yes, my recommendation is, yeah, you don't go out and just do one pop-up or one event. Yeah, you're going to get some leads that day and hopefully you close some deal. But to me, it's a real well thought out strategy and doing it consistently. The brands that are doing that, they're the ones that are seeing the most results. Yeah. I mean, and I have a question too about even the scalability factor, because I know this is a really great exposure tool. It's great to build that connection. And then also you are kind of going on this assumption that over time word is going to spread. So is this really a facilitator of word of mouth marketing and just getting more than just the exposure to the people that you're actually meeting at those venues and at those events and relying on that to spread in its own organic way? Or what is the follow-up methodology to this? Yeah. So you're basically looking at this in a couple of different ways. So A, you're going out, you're doing your experiential marketing program. You have your table, your tent, maybe you're doing cornhole, spin the wheel. You're doing something that's kind of engaging that us as consumers and as humans, we're just naturally curious creatures. So we now have this set up. Someone, like you mentioned, the Ace Hardware, like, what's going on over there? That's interesting. They're giving away a gift card. They spin the wheel. There's cornhole there. Like, well, this is kind of interesting. What's going on over there? So now we've got their attention. Well, now maybe we're enter the win, or maybe we're documenting that experience. And now we're sharing that online through social. 
So now this is living both online and offline. So the main goal though is, okay, when we're there, what is our main objective? What is really our goal? And maybe the goal is just getting their cell phone number or email. Now we're getting that lead into the lead funnel. Now that lead goes in the funnel. That lead now gets passed off, depending on how sophisticated the organization is. Now that lead is getting passed off to someone internally. So now it's like, to your point, yeah, the follow through is like, where the likelihood of T-Mobile selling a $1,500 iPhone at that retail store, they probably do it. It's probably slim to none, but it's like, okay, how can we have that super engaging conversation? How can we get their contact information for now a follow-up to now have a much more deeper conversation to really sell them on, hey, we're the window and door people. This is a thirty dollars or $40,000 investment to do windows and doors for your home. This is not something you're going to decide in the parking lot of an Ace Hardware. You probably need to talk to your significant other, but now I got your cell phone. Now I got your email. Now I can drop that email into like a, a CRM, like a MailChimp. And now you're peppering, I don't know if you necessarily use the word peppering, but now you're following up with that consumer with an email. Now this goes on for maybe six months. There's a much higher probability that that email address now turns that lead, now turns into a sale. So you're exactly right. It's not just being there, hanging out, engaging with the community. It's also, okay, how can we leverage this experience so it lives on social? How can we leverage it so now we're building up our email platform to send out emails to all these leads that we're getting? We'll be back right after this. When you and I got married, our finances were all over the place. But we came across Monarch Money, and that has been a game changer for us. A big game changer. Can you imagine if we had that from the beginning? I'm the one who keeps track of the finances in our (laughs) home, and this to me is just like, ah, it is a sigh of relief. Monarch is a top-rated, all-in-one personal finance app. You get a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. You can create custom budgets, you can track your progress toward financial goals, plus Monarch Money automate smart money moves to get you closer to your goals. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash MU. The cool thing too is you can share your Monarch account with your partner, with your financial advisor, your accountant, or anyone else that's involved in your finances. You can also customize it to fit your needs. And there are no ads and they never sell your data to third parties. After trying Monarch for myself, I can understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, listeners of this show will get an extended 30-day a free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash mu that's m-o-n-a-r-c-h-m-o-n-e-y dot com slash mu for your extended 30-day free trial mm-hmm. yeah because it would be exhausting and i almost feel like old school marketing to just only rely on show up show up show up and if you don't show up you don't get leads you don't get sales so the follow-up is always important no matter what the top of funnel awareness methodology that you choose Are you finding that this works across the board for all types of businesses? Is there a specific type of business that this this works best for? Honestly, I'm seeing this very successful in home improvement. I'm seeing this very successful for telecom, energy, insurance. I mean, anyone that is really out there selling a service, this has been extremely successful. We have some amazing partners. So you mentioned scale. So we have a strategic partnership with Walmart. So when you're talking about just volume and to scale and you're talking tens of thousands of people. So now it's like, okay, we're doing the experiential marketing. We're getting out in the community. We're integrating our brand into the fabric community. And now we're leveraging a brand like Walmart. Now we're building consumer confidence. You could see how this the recipe for success is all there. So if I'm a consumer, it's like, oh my God, never heard of this brand, but they're at Walmart. So, okay, they have to be good. They're now, there's a strategic partnership now tied into Walmart, the number one retailer in the world, or they're tied in with an Ace Hardware or your local grocery store. It just builds that immediate consumer confidence with the end user. So I don't see an industry where this doesn't work for, but you have to have the infrastructure, right? Not every, you know, some of your listeners are like, oh, we don't have brand ambassadors or we don't have a sales team yet. We're basically just doing everything online, which is great. That's how you start your business. You crawl, walk, run. The companies that we're working with that have a sales team that they can actually go out into the community and have those conversations, those are the companies that are doing extremely well. I mean, it's performing Mm -hmm. really well for them. Yeah. When you say you have the strategic partnership with Walmart too, as we're talking about setting up booths, experiential marketing, are we talking about with placement of the product long-term or with doing these pop-up shops and things within Walmart? 
Yeah, we stay laser focused on the experiential standpoint. So it's really a pop up. Brands are coming out, and when no one's shaking hands and kissing, baby. Well, man, maybe we are to doing that again. But yes, for us, it's all about taking your brand and integrating you into the fabric of the community. So no, it's not just hey, we got you an end cap or you're an aisle twelve. Mm-hmm. For me, it's much deeper. It's all about making those really, really deep connections and interactions with your target audience. So that's how we're helping the brands. We're not just kind of getting your product placed in the cosmetic section in your local grocery store. Our, our strategy is like, okay, let's actually get you out in the store to actually have those conversations with your potential target customer. And so this is going to look different, like depending on the size of my business, I could be a smaller scale and it might be a recommendation of partnering with you guys and setting up the booth at Ace Hardware to help me. And I'm really maybe a one to five person team. Yeah. And then large scale where you have ambassadors, you have sales reps that are in all different states and you're setting up partnerships with stores like Walmart where they can do pop-ups in multiple locations, even at the same time. And it's a much bigger, I imagine, strategy and picture on how you're doing that, but it works at all levels. It really does. So we have publicly traded companies that can scale and they're out growing. And it's obviously for them, they're seeing fantastic numbers. And then we have your smaller, I don't want to say mom and pop businesses, but they're very small, one to five people. And they want to go out to a retail like an Ace or a garden center or a local grocery store that's seeing tens of thousands of people per week. And they're now taking their brand and exposing it to a whole audience that never even knew they existed. So it works for everyone and all of our clients, they come in all different shapes and sizes. So anyone listening that has a very, very small business, we can help you a medium sized business. Great. We can help you. And then, yeah, we're a publicly traded company. We can help you on an international level. So there's something for everyone there. You know, if you have an, if your audience is a human, (laughs) that human, when they leave their house, they go somewhere. How I explain it is like, I'm like match.com. So there's a brand and there's a retailer or grocery. It's my job to kind of connect the the kind of be the conduit of your brand is trying to reach a target audience. That target audience shops here. Let me connect it to, and I'm going to place you right there. So when the consumer is kind of coming in and out of that location, they obviously believe in that other brand, that retail brand. So now that the fact that they see you there, there's an immediate connection, there's immediate consumer confidence. And now you're just having a very loose, organic conversation to your potential consumer. And that's been kind of the the recipe for success. I hmm, love that. And it's great that that can work. So if I'm somebody who has this, I mean, really any level of business, but let's say a lot of our listeners are in the early stages of building something and I want to start stepping into this space. What does it usually look like to have that conversation with the vendors? I know your agency specifically has those partnerships, but if somebody listening is like, Hey, I can't work with you yet, Ray, what am I looking at in terms of what are the steps that I take to start showing up at these events and making sure that I'm picking the right ones? And what do I need to be prepared for? What does the vendor need to understand about how is it advantageous for them to partner with me and those kinds of things? Yeah. So any one of your listeners out there that wanted to some deeper insight, they can contact us and I will help them for free just for them being a subscriber to your podcast. So first and foremost, love to help other business owners. But to answer your question, first things first, research and development. You really need to understand your brand and you need to make sure your company is prepared. You're going to go out into the field and have conversations. You're going to get leads. <laughs> Guarantee you, I can tell you right now, you're going to get leads. Is your company set up from an infrastructure standpoint to what are you going to do with that lead, right? Do you have the capabilities? Do you have the bandwidth? Do you have the process? Do you have the systems in place? So there needs to be kind of like some things that need to be done kind of on the front end before you even get out on the field. Assuming for a second, you have your systems or processes in place. You're good. Like, right, we're doing online stuff. We're getting leads come in. We know how to do the fulfillment. Now we want to expand our reach, so to speak. I kind of mentioned in the very beginning of the podcast you want to first identify your target audience and really think about, okay, we know our customer. We really truly know our customer. Granted, we will probably get a little smarter about our target customer now that we're actually getting out in the field and having a conversation with them. But for the most part, we know who we're trying to engage. Okay, where is that customer when they're not engaging with us? So now it's like, maybe it's an event. Maybe it's a retail store. Maybe it's a high-end retail store. Maybe it's like a clothing store. Maybe it's a, who knows what it could be. It could be a lot of different things. Like I mentioned garden centers and stuff like that. It could be the local bowling alley for all I know, whatever the case may be. And now it's going out and having a conversation with that retailer. And this is probably where we provide the most value. A lot of the retailers that we work with 
and you know this, you've been in the mall and there's like that person trying to spray you with like that new age cologne or something you don't need. <laughs> like the retailers are very, very on high alert from a hardcore solicitation standpoint. So our agency has done a good job of really coming up with, hey, here's the code of conduct. Here's the best business practices. Here's how we want to engage the consumer while we're literally at somebody's home or at their place of business. So you can do this on your own, but this is probably the area where we provide the most value. And oh, by the way, we already had these contacts and relationships. But if they weren't ready to work with us, that would be my advice is make sure you first look internally. Make sure you have your system and processes set up in place. You know your target audience. Now you know where your target audience is when they're not engaging with you. Now you go out and engage those event producers, those promoters, those retailers, introduce yourself and talk about your amazing product and how you can provide some additional value to their customer. That would be my advice. Love it. Do you, this is kind of playing off of even the question before this, but when it comes to, we talked about follow-up, but even preparation and awareness leading into, do you help with any marketing or do you recommend doing some marketing saying, we're going to be here? This is, you know, how radio shows say, like, we're going to be at this location on this day and we're doing these giveaways. I know we run, we see ads that are promoting things like that. We're going to be at the farmer's market. We're going to be here. There's a company that's a local food truck and they announce, you know, on Facebook or through ads when they're going to be at locations throughout this, the state. So do you do some of that as well? Do you find that to be advantageous to promote awareness for the fact they're going to be there? Is it pretty much just show up and whoever organically shows up, that's who you're trying to talk to? Yeah, you're exactly right. So we put together a whole pre-plan before we even show up. And it's, I mentioned those other things like from the last question is just making sure internally. Then it's the question of, okay, what are we actually doing there? Right? So it's like, okay, we talked about you. Okay, what does our setup look like? Is it a six foot table? Is there a table square? Are we inside? Are we outside? Do we need a tent? What are we doing from a lead gen tactics? How are we, what are some like fun little icebergs? So we, are we bringing brand ambassadors? What are the brand ambassadors wearing? What are they doing? Who's engaging the conversation and pulling that consumer over to our table? Who's having the more deeper conversation? Is there one people or is there two? So we kind of go through a whole plan of like, okay, before we even get out into the field, what are our objectives? What are our KPIs? What are we doing before we even step foot on the property to make sure everyone is aligned, right? And then there's, to your point, yes, let's market this. Let's do some fun things on social, whether it's on X or Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, of letting our audience know, our core audience know, like, hey, we're going to be here. Maybe you're tagging the retailer. So maybe now you're tapping into their audience and they're kind of like their social followers. So now you're creating some pre-event excitement before you even show up on the property. And then I mentioned it before, while you're there, you definitely want to document this stuff. So now that experience, all that goodwill that you created now goes on way beyond the event. And now someone who's maybe thinking about your product we all do this. We go into the website, then we go into their social channels. We start to kind of get a sense of like the company. Do I align with this company? Does this company resonate with me? And doing those fun social things with experiential marketing, what you're essentially doing, you're now creating a personality. You're now creating a personality of your brand. And that's what consumers are looking for. We're all consumers. We all buy things, certain things, because there's some sort of like connection to that brand. Doing the experiential marketing, documenting that stuff, whether it's just simply by photos or by videos, you're now creating your like your real personality. And that's probably going to increase the probability of that consumer buying your products and services. So yeah, we put together a whole plan before we even get out into the field to make sure while we're there, we want to maximize our efforts and make sure we get our ROI while we're there. Yeah. So you mentioned a little bit of, obviously you have this figured out with your agency best practices and making sure we alleviate any of the fears and the boundaries with the <laughs> retailer. Are there advantages on their end? Like, is there some kind of a, a pitch to them that they're seeing, you know, this actually would be really good for our company too, because even now, as you just touched on the cross promotion capability, you know, you're probably a small fish in comparison to this company that you're wanting to partner with or this event. And I know that's probably different depending on what that is, whether it's an event where that's the sole purpose is to bring vendors together versus maybe a store where it's like Walmart or Ace. When you don't even have those established partnerships, what is the advantage to the retailer or the company to allow you to do this? Is there any kind of a pitch for that? Economics. <laughs> they love the money. No, I'm joking. I think there's a couple things. Um, clearly, we're paying them to be there, right? So now mm -hmm. we're showing them here's a better way or a creative way 
to help monetize your property. You can go in the news right now and there's so many different stories of commercial real estate down. We, we live in a different world now with remote and people working virtually. Commercial and retail is down. I mean, there's Amazons out there, right? So what I think we've done is we've come in and said, hey, there are other ways if you're a retailer, and there might be a retailer listening to this or a grocery store, like, man, I would love to figure out creative ways to help monetize my property. So first things first is obviously money. Not everyone is driven by the good old American dollar. So there's the value, right? How can we enhance the customer experience while they're at your store. And that comes, like I mentioned before, that comes in a couple of different forms. Could be a gift card, could just be insight, could be education, could be swag, could be merchandise, could be a lot of different things that the retailer could be like, oh, wow, that's interesting. It could just be the fact that we're there. This has been a big problem with a lot of the big box retailers. And I'm not suggesting the brands that were there are security guards, but shrinkage and loss prevention is a big problem. It's a big problem and you like, Target, Walmart, all of the grocery stores, especially in the cities, loss prevention and shrinkage is a huge problem. So just purely having more activity, having more people at your store, having more engagement, someone just simply making eye contact with consumers as they're coming in deters shoplifting, right? So there's a lot of there's a lot of like softer things that we like to tell the retailers, like, hey, by having us there. We're over here. We're not in the way. We're not getting involved. We're not in the way of point of purchase. We're providing value. There's an economic benefit. We're here to enhance the customer experience. Maybe we're there to also deter someone from shoplifting. We're giving them a gift card. So there, to me, there's a lot of different things that we're doing from a value perspective that the retailer can be like, okay, you know what? This sounds interesting. Let me pilot this out. If this doesn't become a problem, great, right? We would be open to hosting more events with your agency. And I think we found like a really good recipe for success from doing so many of these events. I think we have it kind of figured out on our end. Yeah. I mean, I think this should have been obvious from the start in terms of this is going to be an expense of paying these venues to be there. I think I'm still in like pop-up shop and just being able to set up something because we've done things with our kids with setting up a little shop in front of Ace Hardware and they didn't charge us for it. No. But this where it's like it usually is going to be the case, especially if you're in an event space where you have multiple vendors, this is going to be something you're going to have to anticipate spending money for. You're not just they're not going to do it out of the goodness of their heart of saying, yes, please come and promote your products within my business or in front of my business. So that's something we need to keep in mind, too, is this all marketing has an expense attached to it. So are you finding this a Dependent on location, is this a moderate thing? Is this depending on size of the company and what terms of an investment we're looking at to be able to show up in these places? It really depends. I mean, you're talking a couple hundred dollars, tens of thousands of dollars. It really ranges. How many gift cards are we purchasing? How, what value are we providing as it relates to swag and stuff like that? But let's put it this way. We work with a lot of very, very small companies, small companies. So we're not talking a ton of money. I mean, to go to the farmer's market might be 50 or a hundred dollars. They're not expensive activations. They're really not. Yes, there are some larger retailers that have their the price of real estate in their mind is more expensive. We have certain retailers that are in markets like New York City. The the price of the way they value real estate is a lot differently than someone who maybe has a grocery store in Jackson, Mississippi. So by region, the type of Retailer, the frequency, how long are we there? Well, we're just coming out for a weekend. Okay, that's that, we can work through that. Or it's like, we're going to be here for the next three years. Okay, well, the terms are now differently. So a lot of the negotiations start to get a little more favorable and a little more attractive. But to answer your question, any brand that's watching this podcast right now can afford to do this. We're not talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yes, there's probably brands out there that are spending a lot more, but we're talking huge scalability, international activations and stuff where T-Mobile, AT&T, these companies, yes, they are spending a lot of money, but they also have hundreds of field marketing managers out there doing this every single day. But anyone listening to this podcast right now can absolutely, again, they have the infrastructure and the processes and the systems in place can afford to do this and we'll see results from it. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. I think it's great that we have all the information. It was probably, like I said, obvious for everybody else, but I just wanted to make sure that we understood that this isn't, this isn't a charitable thing. This is something <laughs> we have to anticipate expense with for sure. Yeah. Have you found, I know we've touched on this and I, at the risk of being repetitive, 
I want to just talk a little bit more too about how we have those processes built in. We've established those relationships. We show up. I'm thinking as a consumer too, when I go into Costco or these places and there's third party vendors there and what is it that really engages, I know giveaways are a great incentive, but even on a a human level, are you finding there's some character traits and some people who do better at this than others that the hard sellers versus soft selling. And do you know what I'm asking? (laughs) Yeah, there's in the so there's a little bit of art and science. And to me it's sales is sales. And to me it's like the sales has really not changed much. The more conversations, the more engagement, the more likely you're just going to get a lead into the funnel. So what I would tell you is that generally speaking, an outgoing personality tends to do better. That outgoing personality is willing to just, you don't have to be aggressive. You don't have to hardcore solicitation, but it simply is just making eye contact with people and just saying hello. It's simply just saying hi with a smile on your face. That, just that is enough where people might just walk around and say good morning or good afternoon or how are you doing or just greeting someone and just putting, having a smile on your face to me is first step. And having the right attitude. And then as you start to get a little deeper, then it's like, okay, now I want to listen. I want to understand. And I feel like a lot of salespeople, they get in the habit of just, they just want to talk and sell and sell and sell and sell. And to me, the really good salespeople out there, the ones that can really understand, we're really solving a problem. And it's like, we don't know what problem to solve until we hear the problem. And so for me, as it relates to like problem solving, it's really kind of getting into what I like to call solution-based thinking. But to answer your question, yes, all the lead gen tactics to spin the wheel. We've all been at events and there's all these like fun little like there's the photo booth and stuff like that. Not everyone has that budget, right? To go out and run a photo booth to do these fun little like campy things on location. Some of it could be as simple as just outgoing, personality, happy to be there, passionate about what they're doing, and just simply saying hello to every single person that's there and not sitting there like on their phone. Like you'd be shocked. And you can mention Costco, you'll see people there just not, not engaged, looking down on their phone. It's like, if you're going to be there, why not maximize your time while you're there? Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about the solution-based marketing? As I know, we're talking a lot about this specific framework. You obviously though have a knack and a genius for marketing in general. So I know that some of those principles of what you just even mentioned, I would love to dive deeper. They apply to us regardless of the modality that we choose to market. So I feel like that's an important philosophy that we could talk about over and over and over again on the show because it's so important to understand the power of problem and solution marketing. For me, it's everything. I mean, that's really the impetus and the success of my business really comes down to solution-based thinking and being able to solve problems. That is it. That is what we do every day. Granted, we're out marketing products and we're telling people about this shiny object of like you may or may not need, but ultimately we're just solving problems. So for me, the brands that we're working with, they have a problem. And like I mentioned, COVID happened, events shut down. The problems for the brands were they still needed to go out and engage the community. And clearly we couldn't, we had to do it in a safe and socially responsible way, social distancing, the mask. We remember all these sort of things, but it was like still understanding what is their problem. And for me, it was being able to, okay, I got to identify their problem. And now I need to come up with a solution to kind of fix their problem. And the solution for me was as they're shutting down all these businesses, gyms, restaurants, what one thing they could not, one thing they couldn't shut down were places that were deemed essential. Okay. Solution. Brand needs to sell their products. How does brand get out into the marketplace and sell their product? The the solution is let me identify places that are deemed essential. Okay, now the brand, that brand has a certain audience that they need to get in touch with. Let me try to find that consumer. Where are they at? Let me problem solve on that. So for me, it's really sitting down with the brand, whoever you're working with or your customer for that matter, and really understanding what are your challenges. And those are the questions I like to ask. You know, What kind of keeps you up at night? What are the certain things that kind of just rattle around in your head and just take up real estate in your head? And if you can get that out of your client and for them to give you that, and now it's a matter of your team sitting back and like, okay, now let me develop a strategy. Let me develop a kind of like a solution for their problems. If you can do that to me, that's everything. Yeah. I, like I said, that's important across the board, no matter what you're approaching. I think sometimes we have a tendency to 
focus so heavily on the solution we know we have, but we forget what is the solution for? Like, what is the problem that they're having? Or where's the gap and where can I meet them with that? And if you can understand that, it doesn't matter whether you show up online, in person, on a billboard. If you can touch on that, then you will have success in sales because that's really what sales boils down to is solving problems, like you said. So appreciate that, that deep dive from your perspective. Yeah, that's, I mean, to me, that's kind of everything. It's been kind of paramount in our success. You think about it, these brands, it's like, it's all performance based. Like, if you really think about it, these brands are going out and we mentioned the softer, oh, we're getting awareness and exposure and visibility and we're playing spin the wheel and we're doing all these like fun things. The brands are not closing deals, getting leads. The program doesn't exist. I mean, that's where we're at in this world. If from an accountability standpoint, from a performance standpoint, that's how, that's my report card. It's our, is, Ray, are your ideas, are your solutions, are they driving revenue for my company? And that's kind of it. So to me, it was like the program <laughs> needed to be successful primarily for me. And that's what I heard with a lot of the brands that we work with. They were going to, my report card and how they were going to hold us accountable was based off of sales. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, anything else that you want to add to us just to give us any final touches on this experiential marketing deep dive that we've done? I know I'm so excited that we've talked on something that really on the Millionaire University podcast, I don't think we've ever talked about. And it's been intriguing to learn about this form of marketing for business. So anything you want to tie that up with? I think we covered a lot today. I would say that have a plan. I mean, that would probably be, it's like a a duh, right? People don't plan to fail. They fail to plan. Like we all know that, but I would say putting together a plan would probably be kind of like the first step. We mentioned the other thing of just making sure like, okay, if you are ready for experiential marketing, you're going to love it. I mean, you're really going to love going out into the field. And the one thing I love about it, which we probably didn't touch on, you learn so much. And as business owners, we always like for me, I just want to learn. I want to get smarter. And at times when you're in the office and you're grinding and you're building you're clearly learning, uh, listening to a podcast like this, but getting out into the field, it's crazy what you learn. And it's something as simple as like being with your team. Like, so you're thinking about like, oh my God, right? Like I always thought like the experiential marketing, it was, we're going to go to this convention in Vegas and we're going to sell, we're going to get smarter, we're going to drive leads. And what I didn't really understand, Ray, it brought my team together. Like there was an empowerment. There was the experience of our team. And it was like, we were able to go out and have all these different interactions with my team. And I learned so much about my team just by being out of the office. So it's like, wow, I would have never understood that. Like there, maybe there's an issue with our team or maybe the team's just really happy or maybe the team just needed that from a culture standpoint. So that's just one example of like getting out into the field and doing experiential marketing. It's not just something as simple as just putting up a billboard, right? You're going to get maybe a lead. You're going to help from branding or awareness and exposure and stuff like that. But that's kind of it. When you're out in the field and you're talking to your end user, you're going to hear some truths. You might not want to hear those truths. You might embrace those truths. You might want to correct those truths. And then your team's there. You get to have a, a totally different interaction with them, which is really fun. You kind of build up the morale of the team, taking them out. Maybe you're going out to a dinner and stuff like that. Like to me, like these are important things. So I would say that when you're thinking about experiential marketing, Most of us look at it from like, and I can mention, hey, Ray, how many sales are we getting from this? But then to me, there's a much, much softer side of going out into the field and kind of engaging the community. So yeah, I would invite everyone, if you haven't done it, to absolutely try it. And if anyone needed some deeper insight of just, hey, Ray, I had some questions or I wanted some more information, I'd be happy to help any of your listeners today. Awesome. Well, and I think I love that my thought that came up as you explained that is there's so many different types of experiences, right? We look at it as this end user experiential marketing, but like you just mentioned, there's experiences at all layers for all levels of the business with the team connection and with you connecting with your people and your consumers. And it's really, truly, there's no replacement for that. I know we have so much advantage with the internet and the amount of people, the quantity we can reach, but it's not necessarily always the highest quality. And if you can take what you've learned in those experiential places and apply that to even more of your efforts in the scalability, then you're going to be all the more prepared and fine-tuned with your marketing efforts. So I'm glad that you mentioned that and touched on that because I wouldn't have even thought about that too as being an advantage. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, the companies out there that are, in my opinion, they're doing everything. 
They're doing their above mm-hmm. the line stuff. They're doing the social pay-per-click SEO. They have a great website. They're doing the experiential marketing. The ones out there that are they're kind of doing it all, they're the ones that are really just seeing just some amazing growth and success. And they're able to kind of scale their business. Not everyone here might be ready for that, but when they are, there's agencies, not even us, there's other agencies out there that can absolutely help you out and grow and kind of get out to the community to do all those little touch points that we just mentioned. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, where can we find you and learn more information if this is a direction that we want to start heading? Yeah, go to oldcitymedia.com. Again, my name is Ray. So my email address is very easy. It's Ray at oldcitymedia.com. And if we can help anyone, we'd love to do so. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ray. Really fun conversation. And it's been great to understand this side of marketing and have our, our minds open a little bit. So again, thanks for bringing all the value today. Thank you for having me as a guest. Of course. Something I love the most about Millionaire University is the access that we're able to have to brilliant people who are coming on and sharing their strategies and the ways that we can enhance and level up our marketing and our business building skills. Thank you so much to Ray and our other sponsors for today's episode and being able to provide this level of value and give us insight and a framework and opening up the door to get another marketing tool and strategy that we may have not considered before. Make sure you're checking out all of our other free resources at millionaireuniversity.com. We'll see you guys on the next episode. Class is officially dismissed.